Hi. Hi. Who's there? Everybody. I think he had uh, someone is not muted, so I think I'll mute everyone. Oh, she moved me. Come with me. Uh, it's Henny Nassim. No? Yeah. <laughs> Is out now. Okay. So I think we just give people a couple more of more minutes and then we can start. Is that okay, Peter? Sure. 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 Thank you. So Peter, you'll be the one sharing the, your screen, right? Yes, can, can you see this? Okay. Yes. So. so I'm sharing this from Teams. So I, I think um, and anybody, okay. um, I can advance the slides, but any, any of the team can advance the slides. Okay. Can you just put the, the slide on, um, yes, on full screen? That will be easier for everyone to see. Okay, that's good. Okay. 
Okay, so um, let's start. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, welcome everyone for this first webinar for uh, this year, 2021. It's a part of a series of webinar we're organizing as GTEx Minatex uh, project in, in Egypt uh, with the, uh, the support and in coordination with a group of um, experts based in the USA. Uh, they will uh, present themselves later. I think for the people who didn't join us before for uh, this uh, series of webinars. So just a quick uh, presentation on the on the project. GTEx Minatex is uh, Egypt is a project from the GTEx Minatex uh, Global Program uh, uh, organized and uh, implemented by uh, the International Trade Center and uh, uh, supported uh, and funded by the, the Swiss and the Swedish governments. We work on the textile, uh, on supporting the textile and clothing industry, mainly with the target of uh, increasing the exports and income generation. Uh, I kindly ask you to mute your, uh, your mics if possible during the presentation and uh, whenever there is anyone who wants to, to, uh, to talk, please raise your hand or just use the, the chat box and we'll be able to answer to your questions. Uh, so uh, I'll, give, I'll give it to you now, Peter, over to you to, to start the presentation, please. Okay, well, thanks, Yasmin. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, the, the topic today is we're going to be looking at go-to-market strategies and business development for the, for the US apparel market. And um, um, the team of speakers, including myself, uh, has uh, Francis Harder. Uh, Francis is a um, um, fashion designer of international renown and um, an entrepreneur um, and also author of um, uh, um, a best-selling book, Fashion for Profit. Um, Jill Mazur is a specialist in information technology, working extensively with uh, big um, apparel brands, uh, not just in California, but also internationally. Um, and Kristen erdman burt is um, a specialist in brand management um, and developed the fashion label for, um, and I'm going to forget their name. Tell me, tell me, Dan. Red Bull. Red Bull. Red Bull. Um, <laughs> yep. And uh, she's also an adjunct professor at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, Maditha Sananaika is uh, my colleague at Cal Poly Pomona. He's the chair of the Apparel Merchandising and Management Program. He's a specialist in um, apparel manufacturing um, uh, with extensive um, uh, knowledge in the area of uh, quality management and supply chain management. And myself, um, uh, I'm former chair of the Apparel Merchandising and Management Department. I'm a professor still in the school, and my specialty is analyzing um, dynamics of competition in uh, apparel and textile industries um, and uh, understanding company behavior. So we actually have quite a diverse set of skills. So we're going to, to talk about um, um, the... the um, strategies for, for moving into the US market. And so please do feel free to interrupt us at any time. So either, as Yasmin said, by uh, raising your hand, uh, writing something into the chat, if, if Yasmin can moderate the chat, um, then do feel free to interrupt us at any time. It's, it's, I think it makes for a much better meeting if we have more of a conversation, less of a, um, um, a lecture, as it were. So um, the starting point uh, before we get into the, the market entry strategies and so on is we're, I'm going to give you an update on the U.S. economy and apparel market. Back in October, um, if you were able to join us at that time, I spoke about what was happening in the U.S. market in the middle of COVID-19. And of course, we're still in the middle of it. Um, we're, we're actually maybe um, deeper in it right now. There's more cases in the United States than there's ever been. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, Los Angeles, where we are located, is the epicenter of the US pandemic at the moment. Um, uh, luckily for us, um, we're not 
uh, we as individuals are not located in the worst hit areas. We tend to be on the outerlying areas of um, uh, Los Angeles and Orange counties. Um, it's mainly in the um, uh, city centers where the, the pandemic is, is worse, but um, um, the US is still in the grips of this. And, um, but of course, we, the other thing that has changed hugely for the United States uh, since October is um, something that happened um, just last week. We, we have a new president with a new outlook on the world that hopefully we can look forward to better things, especially with regard to international trade um, and international travel too. Um, so um, uh, let's start with what's going on in the US economy. This, this chart is telling us, uh, this is showing the, the overall economic growth of the US, zero is here in the middle. You can see that US economic growth is really qu quite low. Typically it's between two and 3% a year, um, unless um, somebody gives away a significant stimulus. Um, and um, then when we get here into quarter two, um, last year, it starts to plunge. And um, <clears throat> in the depths of quarter two, the economy fell 31%. So huge contraction, but then we can see it rebounds um, um, even more sharply to 33.4%. Um, but this is still in real terms, it's still not a recovery. And then of course, growth is snapping back to its historical level. And um, in, in quarter four of 2020, uh, the estimate is that the economy contracted um, um, about, um, um, I think um, three or four, oh no, sorry, this is a growth rate, sorry. So in quarter four, it actually grew slightly, in fact, pretty much close to the historical average. And then in quarter one, it's expected to continue that. So um, the overall estimate is that for 2020, the US economy will have contracted by three and a half percent. And in 2021, um, it's estimated that the um, economy will recover to grow at four percent. So that will be above its long term average. Um, but of course, there are many uncertainties with that forecast. And it's dependent on a number of factors, such as the recovery from COVID-19, how quickly vaccine distribution is going to happen. And right now that's not looking particularly good. There's lots of stories of um, um, them running out of vaccines and not actually having the second dose for those who had the first dose, which then renders the first dose useless. <clears throat> and, um, but, um, uh, another big thing that's uh, yet to be resolved is whether President Biden's promised $1.8 trillion stimulus package will actually make it through. But of course, he does have a majority in um, all branches of government. Um, and then what happens uh, essentially with um, labor markets um, and consumption levels, how um, how buoyant consumers are going to be, um, or are they going to be, um, are they, are they, have they lost confidence? Are they gonna stop spending? And then that will um, subsequently impact unemployment. But interest rates are um, essentially below the level of inflation. So it's actually cheaper to borrow money than not to borrow money right now in the United States. So actually that is going to help buoy the economy. So this is, having just talked about unemployment, here's the unemployment rate. Uh, beginning of last year, a uh, little below uh, 4%, um, and then starts to ramp up with the early impact of COVID-19. Spikes at around 15% in April, um, but then comes down um, fairly steadily until about just before uh, Christmas and New Year holidays. Um, about just a little under 7%. Um, and it's estimated for the, for the year overall, US unemployment in 2020 averaged 11.5%. This is approximately double what it would be in a, in a typical economic recession. And um, 
the projections for 2021 indicate that it's likely to persist at a higher level as disruptions ripple through the US economy. The sectors that are still being extensively disrupted are things like um, um, travel um, with much less air travel, much less um, um, hotel accommodation. Um, in many places, um, eating in restaurants is, is not allowed um, and, um, and restaurants have had to switch to takeout and delivery only. Um, so they're continuing to be extensively impacted. Um, but also many industries are impacted by um, disruptions in the supply chain. Um, there's a lot of products you can go um, 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 seek to purchase, which normally you could have it delivered the next day, or you could find it in stock in the stores. And now you find out, oh, well, it may be in next week, or it'll be, it'll be um, two weeks delivery or four weeks delivery because um, supply chains, uh, not just US, but global, of course, have been disrupted. So, so it's a question of how quickly supply chains will get back on their feet. Um, and then moving on to apparel, this is um, monthly changes in US consumer expenditures um, in 2019. So this is how, um, this is how um, the, the, the last year, the US market was affected by, by the COVID virus. So the red columns in the left-hand chart here are total consumer spending. So we can see that um, in, in March, sorry, in yeah, between March and April, consumer spending fell sharply. Um, you can't actually see it very much, but normally consumer spending was growing at a teeny tiny rate, but then it plunged by over 12% by, by April. But then again, it really shot up again very quickly, 36.9% the following quarter. But of course, that's a 36.9% increase on the plunge that existed before. Um, oh, sorry, this is apparel, sorry, 8.5% um, increase. So, um, but yes, this, the point's the same. It fell by 12.3%, but then it increased by 85 um, so, so spending recovered, but, but given that it had fallen sharply previously, it didn't recover to where it was before. And then the blue line here is apparel. Um, so total spending on clothing. And uh, so we can see that in the depths of the recession, clothing spending fell 27.4%. So remember when, they, when, when COVID came along, they closed all the stores that people couldn't go out. People were just locked down for approximately two months. And the only um, shopping you were allowed to do was um, essential. And typically that was grocery. Um, so um, um, all the regular stores were closed. But once the um, stores reopened, we saw this rebound in spending on apparel. And of course, uh, as we'll discuss, a lot of consumers moved online. Um, Increasingly, consumers have been buying apparel online. COVID-19 has helped to accelerate that trend. But as we can see that after the recovery spike, which is really just a, reco a partial recovery from, from, from this trough down here, um, then apparel spending drops again very quickly. And, uh, um, and it's been quite volatile and peaking um, late summer and then dropping below um, into negative territory again in um, uh, just before the holidays. Um, and then the right-hand chart here is showing um, the breakdown uh, between women's and girls, men's and boys, and children's and infants clothing. The green line is the children's and infants, the women's um, and girls is the red, and the, um, the uh, light orange line is men's and boys. You can see that they're following a very similar path. Uh, children's and infants clothing is slightly less volatile than uh, men's and women's, uh, but you can see um, again that this is really mirroring the, the things we, we saw in the left-hand chart. So, um, so the overall market had been forecast, the apparel market had been forecast forecast to grow at two and a half percent in 2020, but in the end, it's now expected to have contracted by 2.5.
And I think if you'd have asked anybody in April or May, you know, will, is that okay? I think a lot of the industry would have said, okay, yeah, we'll take it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit surprising that overall contraction is just um, um, 2.5% for 2020. And for 2021, the market is expected to show further bounce back and grow by 4.2%. Um, and then after 2021, it's anticipated that it'll just resort, you know, all other things being equal, COVID-19 behind us, that it'll go back to its um, long-term average between um, sort of two, two and a half percent thereabouts. And, um, and that, again, those long-term patterns of consumers being more oriented these days towards experiences, going out, doing stuff, entertainment and so on, rather than um, being more materialistic and acquiring physical goods, those things are going to continue. Um, but some of those leisure experiences, they drive demand for apparel. You know, you want to go hiking, you need the gear. You want to go cycling, you need the gear. So, so it does benefit the um, apparel sector um, in some ways. And um, one of the big trends in the U.S. is really health and beauty. And, and actually, that's been undimmed with um, COVID-19. Maybe, in fact, people with more time at home are actually getting to spend more time looking after themselves. And so health and beauty, and, and I know sales of fitness equipment have gone through the roof because people can't congregate in gyms um, for much of the time since COVID-19 hit us. So, um, so with those trends, the strongest component of the apparel market remains the sports and athleisure products. So anything that's active related and athleisure is, is which we've discussed before is, is the merger of casual wear and sportswear um, and um, that it's, it's higher value, um, higher um, technical specification um, and more comfortable clothing. So the athleisure segment has been the big segment in the US market that's been growing faster. So moving to retail, um, so the big issue with retailing is about it being overstored uh, with the um, steady encroachment of um, online retailing. So <clears throat> um, I remember um, 20 years ago, they said, OK, online retailing is here and it's going to kill retail, you know, brick and mortar retailing. Of course, that hasn't been the story, um, at least until now. And um, but it has been growing steadily. And, um, and of course, COVID-19 gave it a huge boost. Um, in fact, the biggest pressure on retailers has been their business model with um, long supply lines, huge inventories, and then uh, serving consumers that are kind of mm, not sure if I want to buy more clothing or I'd rather go out and do something. So, um, Retailers were already, some retailers were already declaring bankruptcy before COVID-19 came along and were closing stores. But of course, COVID-19 has greatly accelerated that trend. Uh, and it's expected that um, there's, because there's just too many retail stores and, and with now the, the increased um, um, energy in the um, um, online segment, um, that um, there's probably going to be steady store closures over the next three to four years. And, um, and especially amongst the struggling mid-range retailers. And many U.S. retailers have declared bankruptcy. The thing to remember in the United States is that you can go bankrupt and then come back from the dead. Um, it's Chapter 11 bankruptcy, uh, which says that it's, it's called reorganization when you're actually protected from your creditors and um, uh, it gives you time to reorganize your business and come out and, and rebuild it. And um, it's, it's a fairly common strategy in US retailing because it's a tough business to be in. So there's been a huge wave of bankruptcies, store closures. Um, the big guys are still doing reasonably well. Target is still the major force in, in fashion retailing but it's coming under more pressure from Amazon and, and Walmart, because I think Walmart is better online than Target is. Um, and um, 
But the main beneficiaries of the shifts are the online retailers. Um, uh, with all the store closures during the year, it's really boosted the online um, players, especially Amazon, of course. And then the second winners are the discount retailers such as TJX and Ross. Although strangely, some of those companies like I believe Ross did not have an e-commerce business before um, the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the low price retailers are benefiting from consumers who are feeling less secure about their future, seeking lower, lower priced, better value products. The fast fashion segment seems to have been continuing to do really well. Um, and, um, and even a company from Ireland, Primark, has been growing in this segment. But it's something between of a hybrid uh, model between a fast fashion and a, and a discounter. And the worst hit companies in apparel in retail are the department stores, uh, which are really the dinosaurs of retailing. And um, Macy's is not the worst hit of these. Um, but like all the others, it's trying to find a new business model. And Macy's is coming up with the idea of having pop-up stores to showcase new brands or brands that are successful online, but don't have any uh, bricks and mortar presence. So um, I wanted to say something about market segmentation and channels. So my apologies for the complexity of this. Um, chart, but rather than have a whole bunch of um, slides, um, the, the pyramid in the middle is the fashion pyramid, which I'm guessing you're all reasonably familiar with. At the top of the fashion pyramid is the Italian and French haute couture. And then below them are the luxury brands. Um, and um, which are ready-made but super expensive. And then below them are the, um, uh, what they call the bridge brands that are, are premium brands, but, from, but they're the kind of down market brands from the design houses. And then between them and the mass market is the, are the diffusion brands that again, um, you know, more upscale, um, more design oriented. And then when we get to Main Street, we're really in the mass market of fashion. Um, and then the fast fashion segment is at the lower price end of the, the um, main market. And then there's the economy market, those things that are sold um, either it's um, uh, either just low cost unbranded clothing or it's um, clothing that's um, found its way through the um, off price retail segment. So the fashion pyramid and then um, on the left-hand side is um, are the, the retail channels which, and how they serve. So, so all these pink arrows, the high-end boutiques are dealing with the haute couture and the luxury, the upscale department stores are luxury and bridge. The warehouse clubs like Sam's Club and Costco, uh, they do diffusion um, surprisingly, as well as the main street uh, because they're, you know, they're catering to higher income people and um, mass market um, uh, department stores like JCPenney, Sears, um, several, uh, uh, um, serving the main street, high street type um, uh, uh, brands alongside the mass merchandisers like Walmart and Target, uh, specialty retailers like The Gap um, and um, so on, so, suffering, um, serving the, the Main Street market and, and uh, fast fashion, H&M and Zara and so on. And then the off-price retailers um, are servicing the economy market. So these are the either outlet malls, uh, discounters, um, and, and of course, you know, even markets. And then finally, the online. Well, you can find online that services all of these um, segments up to luxury. I, I don't know that there's online that does haute couture, but um, you can find um, online retailers that service all segments all the way up to luxury. Um, then on the right hand side here, we have the segment by, by use, the formal dress, the business wear, the casual wear, 
the athleisure, the sportswear, the outdoor performance gear, and then technical and protective clothing, say like workwear, uh, uniforms, and so on, uh, which of course are a big market in, in the United States. So, um, yes. We have a question here from uh, Ali from Scarabaeus. He's asking, where does sustainable or ethical fashion lie in the fashion pyramid? Uh, so, um, may I jump in on that one? No. Sure. Okay, sure. So it's, it's a bit higher up on the pyramid. Um, ethical, sustainable, eco-friendly, fast, fa uh, eco-friendly types of products require at this point a little bit more effort to and have a little bit higher price point in terms of organic materials or recycled materials or um, renewable materials or regenerated materials. The, the price of the material itself is so much higher that you can't necessarily afford to make those price, types of products for mass markets um, and larger distribution. And it also has a very, it has a, right now it has a smaller segment of the population who is concerned about it. It's certainly growing. And if you look at the news in every different channel, you would be able to see that, you know, footwear companies are making things out of vegan leathers or 100% recycled materials. Companies like Patagonia are um, re recycling their own cashmere and wool to make recycled material uh, recycled products and then there are other companies out there there's um, that are using regenerative materials so things like nylon from fishing nets and nylon from carpet that they're able to regenerate and to turn into materials so companies like Prada are actually you know sort of stepping into the um, eco-friendly world where they are using these regenerated nylon materials to make their backpacks and a lot of the swimwear and surfwear companies are making higher end products out of these eco-friendly materials, but it comes with a price. It would be lovely for us to be able to pass that down into the lower levels of the pyramid, but today it's not necessarily a possibility. However, you know, we do think of um, the lower level on the pyramid as being something where they are taking products that weren't selling in mainstream retailers and reselling them through these off-price outlets and discounters. So in that end, they're actually slightly eco-friendly in that we're not making new product for them. They're just channeling it through this other area. But um, yes, so for now, I'd say it's a much at the higher end of the pyramid. Hopefully pressure from um, consumers will start pushing it down into lower levels of the, of the pyramid. I did have a conversation uh, not too long ago with folks from the Gap brands, which in the States and in, in Europe are Gap, uh, Banana Republic and Old Navy. Old Navy in particular is a mass market, low, low price brand that's very affordable. And when I asked them what their direction was in terms of becoming more eco-friendly, they said at this point in their, in their business model, as much as they would like to be eco-friendly, they just can't afford to be eco-friendly because their margins are just so small on the products that they make that they wouldn't be able to raise prices to be able to use more environmentally friendly materials. Does that help a bit? Thanks, Joe. One more thing I'd like to add that Jill absolutely right I think is the the waste that's involved in the factories themselves that um, the factories be encouraged to uh, either recycle or or not so much waste as they had before it, it encompasses so much the sustainability that it goes all the way down through to production to choosing your fabrics and the waste that's left over after producing the goods so there's there's a lot to sustainability. Uh, as Jill was explaining, and I think people, as the more and more people get aware of it, I think it's much more important that it's somehow incorporated into the thought of any of the manufacturers' processes and also how everything to do with social injustice and all those types of things, it's all part of it. It's, it's part of the new story. And I was also going to thank you, Francis, for bringing up a good point. Um, I was also going to mention things um, dead stock. So there's a big push in the industry, which actually is beneficial to all of us, 
which is using dead stock fabrics, trims, and all of that. So yeah, fabrics yeah. and materials that have already been manufactured that are sitting in warehouses that haven't necessarily been able to be utilized or used. Um, there are companies out there that are now helping to market the dead stock material. So it's lower price material because it's already been manufactured, um, meaning it's less cost to the companies, the designers that are trying to build these products and it's less cost to you because you don't necessarily have to go out and purchase new materials or wait for new materials to be made. The materials are already existing. So that is definitely one way that we can be, become a little bit more environmentally friendly and actually help reduce costs for all of us. I think the other interesting thing is the luxury brands are actually buying back their goods that they've been out on the market for years and reselling them. They're finding that sometimes the resale items are selling for much more money than the original item sold for. So it, there, you know, this whole process is a rethink and it, it's a real adjustment to the marketplace. And as we all know, you know, there's plenty of clothing out there. So <laughs> anyway, thank no, you. We we, we 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 are in one of the most wasteful industries on the planet i think we're we're competing very closely with food for the title of being the biggest uh, <clears throat> creator of waste unnecessary waste as well um i think um it's it's a good point and 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 jill is right that that you know the 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 high very high end part of the market has done the most to focus on sustainability to as a way of reselling themselves to their clients. Of course, companies at all levels have, um, put emphasis on um, social responsibility, on being ethical, uh, and on uh, and um, trying to um, provide their um, uh, green credentials as being sustainable. But of course, the, the the fashion model itself is is is, is isn't sustainable. Uh, we found in um, in talking with brands a few years ago, we estimate that 25% of the product that's made for the U.S. market is um, is 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 destroyed somehow. It it it's um, some of it, of course, gets exported um, to other countries um, like uh, other um, um, developing countries. Uh, mainly in Africa, I believe, um, and um, where it damages the local um, clothing industry. Uh, but a lot of it ends up in landfill. And uh, I know a company right now who is closing down one of their operations and everything is going in the landfill. I mean, they, are, they could give it to charity, but they're just not going to damage the brand by doing that. So there's a lot of companies who, who say they have these credentials and they want to do this, but we have a business model that is essentially unsustainable. It, it's it just in the way that it, it works. And, um, and undoubtedly the future is going to be about um, sustainable models and, and it will come through um, better practices and, and probably also through legislation. Um, because if we're going to turn the corner on global climate, um, we have to, we all know we have to do things faster. Can I chip in? Sorry. Uh, can I chip in? Uh, so um, I, I also think that the question is where does sustainable or ethical fashion fit in this model? I think it fits in everywhere. It's not just, uh, I think it's how you brand. Sometimes it's a hype, you know, you, you call it a sustainable fashion and you try to sell it at a higher price. It does not need to be a higher price. I know Jill, um, I think I agree with you, but I think it, uh, it should be injected in every level on this model and different, uh, different people. I, I have come across recently that there are a lot of smaller brands, actually entrepreneurs, uh, new, um, new, new small, small, small uh, medium companies coming up with lines of products which they call sustainable, but it does not need to be a regenerated fiber to be sustainable. You can be sustainable, as Jill rightly said, in the cutting room. If you are using your fabric properly, if you uh, can get a better consumption on your fabric, that is sustainability, right? If you are using remnants or the dead stock that Jill was talking about, now that is sustainability. If you cut down uh, material, unnecessary material wastage, including your time, your employees' time, right? With better efficient, effective systems, 
Now that is sustainability too, right? So I think it is how you define sustainability, which is a very broad term. So you need to, and you can market it in different ways. You can market it as regenerated fibers, or you can market it as zero waste, or I mean, I can't, I can't say zero, but maybe 2% waste, 3% waste, rather than 15% waste. So it's just, uh, I think, how you define. That's my view. Would like to ask something, if you please. I'm Aida. Hi, Aida. Sure, Aida. Yeah. I would like to ask about, uh, because now everywhere we are talking about sustainable fashion. Do you think that one day fast fashion will not exist anymore? What do you think about this? Oh, that's I, think so long as, I think so long as you have consumers who are clamoring for fast fashion, fast fashion will exist. Um, you know, we, we, ha we had something that happened. It was a very unique situation for our, um, presidential inauguration a few days ago. Huh. And if you know who Lady Gaga is, who's a, a performer, a singer, an artist, she was a, she stood up there, she sang the national anthem. She was wearing a beautiful couture cashmere sweater with a pin and this enormous fuchsia ball gown skirt. And in normal times in our world, you would see fast fashion knockoffs and you probably will of you know, similar outfits that she was wearing in, um, you know, in a very short amount of time because companies would come out and produce it because she is so influential, everybody would want to have that outfit. But instead, the most interesting thing that came out of our presidential inauguration was another politician who was sitting and watching the inauguration and it was cold out. So, you know, people are wearing jackets, he was sitting there in a pair of mittens that had a very specific sort of graphic pattern on them. And he, there are, people have been doing very funny things with this picture of this man who we all know is where, you know, sitting there with the mittens sort of crossed across his chest. The mittens themselves were so identifiable. And what it was, was it was one woman in Vermont, which is a very small state in the, in the US who had been taking sweaters, um, you know, sweaters that she had found at thrift stores and things like that, had been deconstructing the sweaters, had been taking them, cutting out these mitten patterns, lining them with fleece because Vermont is in the northern part of the, of the U.S. and it's very cold. There's a lot of snow up there. And the, the man who was wearing them happens to be a senator from that state. And her mittens in this completely, she's using 100% recycled fleece, 100% recycled sweaters to make the fabrics, 100% recycled everything to make these products. Um, her mittens have sold out, not that she was even trying to sell them, they're not even available right now, it was just a hobby of hers. But it was just, it was so interesting to me, sort of almost kind of the way our minds have shifted to, you know, this extravagant, beautiful cashmere sweater and silk ball gown that our, this performer was wearing to these 100% recycled eco-friendly mittens that our senator was wearing. But I think it's, you know, it, it's kind of a, gives you a picture of a little bit how people's mentalities are starting to shift, especially after this pandemic, where we think about what's worth spending our money on. Um, you know, an extravagant ball gown that we can wear once or these recycled mittens that we wear. And apparently you'd had them for five years, by the way. By the way, um, Jill, so did you see what happened yesterday with that? That story of Bernie? Now no. they've, come out with, they've come out with a printed T-shirt with his picture on it, sitting there with his mittens on, on black. And he, they're selling out all over. So, the, you know, he started this trend, which is quite funny, really. <laughs> Very interesting. I'm going to send you some funny texts later, Francis, with some <laughs> pictures of that. You'll love it. Um, but it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit indicative of where we are now post-pandemic. And I would say pre-pandemic, maybe nobody would have cared necessarily about the mittens. It's a funny picture, but people would have been all over the Lady Gaga Thing. And, you know, the, coming back to your idea of fast fashion, I don't think fast fashion is going to go away, but I hope that we are able to train our consumers that disposable fashion like that isn't necessarily a sustainable type of business. It's not sustainable for our planet. It's not really sustainable for the economy. Um, 
people wow. are people. They're always going to like trends. They're always going to want something new. So I don't think fast fashion is going to go away. But even fast fashion companies like Zara, like H&M, are starting to put in more eco-friendly and sustainable materials into their into their own product line. So they might be higher priced what they're selling, but they are actually starting to think about it as well. So I do think it is we're raising that consciousness. I do and agree. I think. I, I went to the mall for the first time last week. I wanted to investigate what was going on. And those fast fashion stores, they were just cram full of stuff, just a discount, discount, discount. So, you know, there has to come a point where people are, and I do think the millennials are, and Gen Z are becoming far more involved in, you know, not necessarily getting involved in that so much anyway, of course. You know, you still want to buy a, a new top just to reward yourself sometimes, but not that you need it. No, and and yeah, fast fashion is not going to go away, not not anytime soon. That that thing about urgency and immediacy that's that's one of the things that continues to drive the market. So I see that something, I want it now, and fashion, fast fashion grew up to cater to, to that. The downside of it was the disposable element of it. Or wear it a few times and throw it away or just leave it in your wardrobe forever. And that's, that's something that the fast fashion retailers do see as an existential threat to them, that they, they come to be viewed as being um, you know, threats to the environment. So they are working on how do they do fast fashion but make it more sustainable. And, and that's where I also think digitization is going to give us that sustainable model that will only make things um, that people actually want, but through digital printing, digital cutting, uh, digital retailing, um, we'll be able to do it very rapidly indeed. Um, sell it first online, um, even customize it and uh, make and deliver it very quickly. And, um, and I, think, I think the digital model for the industry is the one that's going to cut out the huge amount of waste. I mean, it's crazy that nearly a quarter of what we make isn't actually going to be used. If you think of all the acreage involved in growing cotton and grazing sheep and pumping oil out of the ground to make synthetic fibers, it's insane that we do all of these things, use all of that water to process it all, and then actually it's making something that nobody wants. It's, it's crazy. So I, I do think new business models are going to accelerate out of this um, pandemic. And as I've said in the previous uh, webinars, um, there's a groundswell of small companies in the United States and elsewhere who are developing digital printing as a, as a means to service certain segments of the market. It's not gonna replace everything and not quickly, but the beauty of digital printing is make very rapidly in response to demand. No need to keep inventory of finished product. Um, and we've, we've proven that even retailers could have the garment factory uh, on their premises um, because the footprint is so small to, die, to, to print, cut, and sew. And, um, but, um, but yes, um, sustainability is, is an important part and, and, and ethics is an important part, but I've, I've long been something of a skeptic of how the industry actually behaves. So let's, let's move, uh, move on. And, and sorry, just one final point on this slide is that, you know, one of the things is that, of course, the US market is the biggest market in the world. It's uh, still um, in, in real terms. Um, this is a very highly segmented market. These are very, um, you know, these are very um, um, broad segments. But of course, within this, there's all kinds of micro segmentation. I was just mentioning Primark, who are really bridging between fast fashion and economy. And, uh, and the simple fact is, it, it isn't this simple. Um, there's all kinds of levels of fine segmentation within, of course, in terms of price. And, um, and then the same also with regard to um, uh, um, end uses of clothing that um, 
we know that um, <clears throat> there's business and business casual, and we had casual and sports, and now we have a leisure. There's, there's blends all the way along the line. People are always trying to blend things to see if that gains traction in the market. And in fact, something I did not include on this slide was um, sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And possibly it's, it's because um, I'm, um, uh, like I say, I'm a little bit skeptical that um, US companies like to say, oh yeah, we're all in it, we're all for this, but okay, well, look at your model. We'd, you know, let's do something about it. Oh, well, you know, that's how we always do things. And we have our sunk investments. And, um, and if, if there's a problem in that factory in Bangladesh, it's not our fault because um, our supplier tells us everything is above board. Um, but um, the thing about the US market um, is it is the most competitive. I don't know that there's a market. And please, if any of the other team disagree with me, speak up now because my view of the US market is it about the most competitive market there is. It's, it's very highly served, many companies. Um, it has this concentrated retail model with a great deal of power uh, and sophistication. And, um, and consumers who are really looking for value. I mean, the, the price of some products, I still can find some things in the US and I think, how do they do that for $5? You know, how, how do they do a, how do they do a t-shirt at $7? How, how can you buy a t-shirt from a down, downtown store for seven US dollars? It, it, um, it, it just seems unbelievable that you could grow the cotton, um, uh, knit it, dye and finish it and, and make it into a garment, ship it halfway around the world. And, and sell it in an expensive store in a, in a downtown Euro city or a big expensive shopping mall. The US is, is a big competitive market and um, served by these big um, retailers who um, have very high demands for, for service. Uh, they want speed, they want flexibility and, um, and the actual number one requirement of US um, buyers is dependability. So if you say it's going to be there next week, then it, you know, next Thursday, then it has to be there by next Thursday. And um, if you say Thursday and it comes Friday, then they don't see you as dependable. And so um, dependability isn't speed. It's just that you are good to your promises. And that is a really big thing with, with U.S. buyers. And a lot of U.S. buyer contracts have penalty clauses in them. Um, that if you don't perform per contract, they can issue you with what is effectively a fine. Um, and um, the US retailers have been notorious for doing that. And there was a big backlash when some of them um, uh, reneged on their contracts um, during COVID-19. So I think they're currently on better behavior. Um, but um, US U.S. buyers expect um, you be able to do things quickly. You can be, you can change flexibly. Um, you'll be dependable, and customer service means your communications are really good. I think, as we discussed in the second webinar, and uh, and then of course there's the digital capability um, that they want to be able to see what you're about from your website. Um, if you're if the, you're marketing branded product, um, then they want you to, to also have a role in helping um, highlight your brands online. They expect you to be integrated with their supply chain um, management systems, um, and they will want to engage you in product, they will want you to be engaged in product development. They want to, it's, it's a fast moving market, um, and they want, um, all hands on deck to assist with um, developing new products, um, helping research, come up with ideas, um, and um, helping move their business forward. So they're looking for a partnership, but um, the US retail sector is the classic buyer-driven um, chain. And um, 
here. May I jump in for just a moment, please, yes. on this? Okay, so one of the other things that I was going to say, you're, you're exactly correct on this, but one of the other things with digital capability, which does align with more environmentally friendly, um, socially conscious, cost cutting um, thought is that many companies now are working with 2D and 3D design tools to help create digital samples. So cutting down the, on the amount of sampling that they're creating with physical materials by using these digital materials um, or digital images, being able to integrate pattern making software into these 3D tools that are then taking the pattern, putting it on a figure form, applying these digital materials to it to create more and more realistic looking samples. Obviously, you cannot get away from sampling, but when companies are working to develop these 3D images, they are wanting to be able to work with factories as well to be able to transmit that information, transmit the pattern, transmit the fabric, have those samples made later on in the process once they have the chance to review their line, to cut down on the amount of samples, physical samples they're creating. So many of them are looking to be able to partner with factories who have the capability to work with them in a digital environment, not just with standard supply chain, um, ERP, financial production tracking systems, but now with these design tools as well. And for those of you who are looking to design your own products, um, these digital tools can be a huge advantage for you as well. So instead of spending the time and the labor cutting different fabrics, different patterns and so on, being able to create those digitally um, is a very cost effective way to do it. Obviously at the end, people still wanna touch and feel, you wanna try it on, you want to see what it looks like. But in the first initial phase of the initial proto prototyping design or the first round of sampling or developing it for your sales team or your merchandising team, many companies are moving away from physical samples and into that digital world. Can I just trust one thing that Peter said was about um, the issues with chargebacks, you called it um, fines, right, Peter? It's chargebacks as Not far as... Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, just they, it, they can be incredibly brutal. So it's you have to be... I would say nearly everything you do is going to be built on relationships because if they can, if they decide the goods are not selling fast enough, like last year or this year, it's going to happen, they're going to find a way of charging you back. And I've been employed as an expert witness on a number of cases. And we've even found out that they have purposefully destroyed some of the garments that have been shipped to them on purpose, saying that they were shipped faultily. So you just got to be aware of who you're working with, build a good relationship with them, because when things or things can go wrong, that you can pick the phone up and say, hey, what's happening here? Again, you need to have make sure that you've got your inspections and your agents in place to make sure the goods are all um, passing before they're actually shipped out from your factory. So just sorry, not trying to lengthen this any longer. No, no, I, I, and, and I, I think it's important to know that um, because it's, it's a big market, it's, 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 it's open to trade, um, the possibilities are enormous, but, the, but, but it's a competitive market and retailers, the, the retailers can be tough customers and okay. not all of them um, are extremely aggressive. Um, and, um, but, but, the fact is, these things exist. We read about it all the time. So you have to be you have to be careful. You have to go in with your eyes wide open. That um, you make promises you can keep. Um, that you make sure your your quality is right. Um, and and if you have ways of verifying that, um, uh, proving that it's right when it leaves your factory, I I don't think many retailers. It, I think there are occasional cases where yes, um, retailers do something dishonest. I think most of them are, are, are honest, but um, there are clauses in contracts which you have to look for. They're called chargebacks that, it, you know, if you have a late delivery, they're losing money because the product should be on the shelf selling. Um, the retailers very, very finely manage their businesses. They're looking at how much they're selling off every um, square meter of shelving 
Um, how many dollars is that going to generate? What, what, what profit are they earning from that? And if the product doesn't arrive on time, then they're losing that money as they see it. So that's why they feel justified to provide chargebacks for non-performance. So, well, uh, as you say, you've got to read those contracts because we had a guy in, here in LA, he had a $250,000 first order from Macy's and didn't read it. Jill can probably remember this. And um, he was charged back from a $250,000 order. He was charged back 175000 because he didn't read his manual. So, you know, I'm not to sort of scare you, but you know, you've really got to understand the process when you're selling to the big box stores because uh, they can be brutal. Make sure that your tops are shipped with your bottoms when they're, um, when there is an order for them, they're not, they'll charge you back. They have an actual, um, a charge back department that they make money on. I mean, it sounds brutal, but that's the way it is. They put this company out of business. Right. And, and so if you, if you ship something deliberately because you, you needed to ship 10,000 units and you didn't have enough of a certain color or a certain size, so you, you put something else in there instead, they, they will see it and then they will charge you back on it. Right. So um, you absolutely have to be accurate. Um, you have to be dependable. And um, this is what the contract says. So you have to do exactly that. And, um, and you build up the dependability, then you can build those long-term relationships um, and um, um, that give you the opportunity to stay in this um, this. You know, huge marketplace, and and uh, you can be successful in the U.S. You can build it out to adjacent markets from there. You know, the Canadian market isn't that much different. So, okay, um, let's move on. If I can make my slides work, there we go. So, um, okay. is it Anne? Yes, it's me. Hello, everybody. Really nice seeing you. So we already um, talked about go to market strategy without throwing the slides in. Basically, um, I think what's great, the conversation already gave um, indications about what's important, what are the channels and looking at the segmentations, discussing sustainability. Um, there has, have already been like so many important terms and important um, also um, performance indicators, what needs to be addressed. So when we talk about go to market a strategy, um, it is really important to plan and know, of course, what your business is or what your business in the future should be. And all of you have been doing business in the US for a very long time. So you know what you're good at, you know your services in and out. Um, but also what's then important is to really analyze the US market and say, okay, how is the market structured? What are the right channels for me? And that goes hand in hand with the segmentation and the price points um, you wanna sell and who your target group in the US market is. All of that is important. Like even now when you're on a stage and you already have existing an existing customer segment you're addressing, but you wanna expand, think of, what, where else could we go and where else does our portfolio fit in? And if it doesn't 100% fit, maybe you have to also go back and say, okay, how do we need to adjust in the future? So um, we want to look at in the next um, slides. Oh, is that a question? No. Um, we want to look in the next slides, like how to de decide that. And um, I have a very simple pyramid here. The, the first question, of course, is always the what, the product and services. And I want to touch on sustainability because we talked about it. Um, we know sustainability is a, is a, a two sides discussion. Of course, it is expensive also investing. Um, and with the companies we've talked the last couple of months, also in the Egyptian market, we know it is always sometimes customers required, sometimes not. But the what question, what are the, your product and services? I think it's important to, to, on one hand side, know what you're good at, but then also look at the trends and what's required in the market and trying to develop in that direction that it makes sense to you. With knowing that for the future, um, of course, the who, your target customer, 
who's the retailer you want to address? How are you going to get to your buyer, the sourcing manager? Who are the people you're going to, at the end, you want to talk to? And make sure you write it down, have it outlined somewhere. Um, because I know everybody I talk to, everybody knows, oh, I want to have big orders or I want to have like, this is the quantity I want, but with whom do you want it? Who fits your price segment and who exactly is that? And then um, do the research, who is that in the US market? And then of course the how comes after you've defined your what and your who um, are the right distribution channels. And uh, later we're going to touch on is that your um, business to business? Is it only through trade shows? Are you going to go direct to consumer? What is the business model you can also like really realistically execute and what works for you long term? And I'm going to hand over to Mudita. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for joining. So, um, so as Anne uh, and uh, the panel discussed, uh, I think it's um, to answer the question of uh, what product, who uh, to contact and how to uh, achieve this goal of go to market. Uh, it it's a, it's a, um, it's an overall strategy. It should start from uh, the corporate. So the corporate strategy that drives the business strategy that drives the functional strategy. And uh, based on our recent readings and uh, meetings and discussions, uh, it is very clear that uh, we need a digitally enabled go-to-market process uh, that needs to be implemented by the companies. Uh, and I think the corporate, uh, it, it should be like a forceful but a collaborative approach within a company. Uh, it has to be started from a corporate uh, uh, as a business development process or go to market process, which is pretty much the similar uh, um, similar thing we are talking about. Uh, you have to have an effective uh, business development or go to market strategy starting from corporate that drives business and uh, uh, drives the functional strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the uh, uh, one of the surveys that I was reading recently uh, from McKinsey, in, uh, uh, which was uh, done in 2018 with 54 uh, key executives uh, of companies, which is about $110 billion in revenue, the 98% of them actually said that their priority is to improve the go-to-market process and the disciplines now. So in order to do that, you have to start with the corporate strategy. And this is not something that is new. You all know what um, the corporate uh, the, the strategies are. Uh, however, it has to provide sufficient finance. It has to uh, achieve the supply chain uh, and sourcing and supply chain strategies, product strategies, uh, branding and marketing strategies, operation strategies, and how to plan uh, these strategies in order to achieve the uh, goal of going uh, uh, to, to get to the market properly. So if we are talking about, we have been talking about this moving from cut, make and trim to own brand in the previous webinars or um, uh, strategies like vertical integration, it's, it's similar. You have, to, you have to have a corporate strategy that support uh, a better go-to-market strategy. Now in that particular survey, uh, about half of that, the 98% said that their priority is to go to improve the go-to-market strategy. And about half of that companies actually said they have appointed a dedicated team. So that means they are understanding that this has to be started from the corporate and it has to drive down into the, um, into the functional level. So let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, driving from corporate strategy to the business strategy. So in that survey, I thought of uh, sharing this information because I think it's very interesting. It's not, it's a survey that was done in 2018. Um, there, these are the, like the highlights. Uh, there are about 92% of large fashion companies in that survey, that is uh, 2.5 billion or more. They, uh, the companies, they said that they are struggling uh, to make timely decisions and stick to deadlines. So that is a very scary situation. So that's about almost 100% of these big 
companies they said, said that it's very difficult, they are struggling actually to make timely decisions and stick to deadlines. We know that our industry is very complex and uh, so many variables to fight with, right? So uh, they, they think that their product uh, bringing uh, to the market is fairly slow. Uh, they said that 70% said that they are faced uh, in uh, issues with accurate planning and forecasting. Uh, and then out of that survey, actually three areas that were highlighted that they think that they need to do is accelerating the speed to market, bridging art and science through merchandising and mastering digital and analytics. So that was the outcome of that survey that they said, if you want to have a um, effective go-to-market strategy, to United States. Today, you need these three things, accelerating speed to market, bridging art and science through merchandising, and mastering digital and analytics. Now, if we consider these things in, an, in a general business strategy um, framework, we know that the, mark, uh, the, the understanding the market and consumers is very important, right? And we have been talking about it. Then accelerating speed to market is inevitable. The bridging art and science through merchandising is one of the things that came out of that survey. Mastering the digital and analytics. So you cannot, it's very, it's imperative. We cannot live without that because you need to have data and you have to analyze data. And then based on that data, you have to make decisions uh, based on scientific background. Of course, marketing, uh, branding, promotion, uh, communication and trust. It's very important that as we discussed earlier, that when you deal with um, the brands, the communication and trust, you have to keep the word and you have to trust and they expect you to be trustful and then you expect them to be uh, trustworthy. Supply chain visibility, of course, performance and visibility is very important because the decisions have to be made fairly fast and the decision should be made based on information. So the visibility is, uh, is very important. Of course, we have been talking in previous uh, webinars about the efficiency and effective improving efficiency and effectiveness of people and processes, which is inevitable. Uh, we also found uh, out that the importance of human resource, the middle level managers, uh, and uh, the, the people who are working um, is very important. And of course, you have to develop a culture of innovation uh, within your organization. So that these are the kind of I mean, these are, these are things that we know, but we have to concentrate on these strategies if you want to achieve uh, these goals that uh, the survey brought up as speed to market, combining art and science with merchandising and mastering the digital capabilities and analytical capabilities of an organization. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the uh, functional strategy, uh, again, the survey really focused on, this is, this is the, the product design development and delivery. And uh, it has to be focused on the go-to-market process. Uh, and it is the heart of an apparel organization. And it should be uh, cross-functionally aligned. That means you cannot have one department doing this. As I said earlier, it has to be coming from, it should be from corporate to the business, to the functional level. And again, these are not something new that we, we know that we need to have ac uh, accurate demand planning forecasting. We have to have uh, good technologies in place in order to, uh, in order to function as a, as a manufacturing company, uh, the improve the speed, the design development and production process using technologies and systems. Uh, improve the vent allocation and production capacity planning. So you have to identify the uh, a good, you have to do sourcing with vendors. You have to identify good vendors. You have to identify, you have to make sure that you properly plan capacities with the vendors in order to get the products on time and then go through the develop design development production process, depending on whether you CMT, half package or full package. Uh, the communication consistency is also very important because um, you, you have to make sure, again, it builds up on trust with the consistency of your communication. You have to make sure that, that you are communicating through the uh, 
throughout your uh, sourcing chain uh, so that it can be vendor managed inventory, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, having the right talent and capabilities, again, it goes back to the uh, people, then stick to the deadlines as much as possible and the decisions, and then improve the organization culture for innovation. So these are uh, considered as the strategies that you have to implement in order to uh, improve your go-to-market strategy. Next slide. So we have, uh, we saw this, if you participated in the previous webinars, uh, I'm sure you saw this slide. So this is the Divistas development process uh, from CMT uh, moving to half package to full package to your own brand. Again, it is a corporate strategy, corporate uh, decision that what you will do, are you continuing with the CMT or you actually want to uh, move on to half package and so on and so forth. So um, moving from domestic to international sourcing, to international sourcing and design, to global supply chain management, to global supply chain management and marketing going from CM2 to own brand. Now, um, now this, um, the business development strategy, depending on what you would want to do as a company, uh, there's a process um, segmentation strategy that you have to implement. So there are four uh, process segmentations that um, we usually know, the seasonal collection process, that is the general uh, seasonal uh, product design development process, or you can, uh, you also have to have the capability to do, uh, we call it read and react, which is in season replenishment. So that is, you have the seasonal uh, line that you develop, uh, produce and sell, but based on the information, how the products are sold, you have in-season replenishment. So you have to be ready uh, to have the in-season replenishment. Uh, readiness is important if you want to have a good uh, go-to-market uh, strategy. So you have to prepare with that. Then uh, there's a, another uh, sector called fast track or the additional process. So that means within the seasonal collection process, again, in, depending on, let's say you got a, a priority order, a quick order from a, a buyer you should be able to design, develop, and produce something and uh, pr uh, provide sampling and development process and then actually manufacturing process within the uh, seasonal collection process. Then you also have another strategy called never out of stock. So these are for mostly the staples. Uh, these are not like fashion uh, products, but mass produced staples. Uh, you should be able to have a, um, proper planning process and the implementation process so that in case if one product sells more, so you will not go out of stock, you will have the material in-house, you will have uh, the, the um, quick planning and uh, operation in process to replenish goods uh, for buyers. So if you have this seasonal collection or read and react or in season or the uh, fast track, which is uh, developing a designing, developing, and producing something faster, and then uh, never go out of stock. So these are kind of um, uh, process strategies that if you have to have in order to have a better go-to-market uh, process. So uh, next slide. I think it's uh, Jill who is taking over from here. Uh, yes, unfortunately, can you can you guys hear me? I am having a bit of a challenge. I just got kicked off of my computer and I am trying to get back into the Zoom app. Um, and I'm maybe we can skip my slides for a second while I uh, move forward. And we can hear you. But we can, we can hear you. Okay, you are. Right. and see you very well. Okay, I'm gonna yes. hold this up here and squint to see from my phone and the slides that are about this small. Okay. So in terms of the technology strategy, so we've, we've in the webinars that I've done and in the webinars we've talked about in the past, when you are looking at um, a cut, make and trim operation, you need to have the basic technology for any apparel manufacturing, pattern making, marking, grading, cutting, um, you know, any of the hardware that you are planning to operate in your factory, as well as, um, the ability to track your orders 
the ability to track your inventory. So when you think about moving toward a more robust operation, having shop floor control, having production planning, having ERP or enterprise relationship planning software, which has inventory management, sales order management, um, accounting software in it, uh, or account, uh, excuse me, accounting in it, purchasing management, profitability management, um, all of those things are included in ERP, as well as the tools that you need to be able to communicate with your customers, the tools that you need to be able to communicate with retailers. So globally, we use technology called EDI, which is electronic data interchange, and it allows companies to be able to transmit purchase orders, sales orders, shipment notices, invoicing, even um, payment notices back and forth electronically so that people aren't responsible for having to try to send that via email and keep updating systems and so on. So in today's world, 90 plus percent of companies are communicating electronically as opposed to the, well, they're communicating via their systems as opposed to email. And as you move forward into full package or having your own brand, when you need to be able to design products on your own, just like we were talking about before, many companies are starting to take advantage or if they're not already taking advantage of things like Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw, which is a two-dimensional design tool, moving into three-dimensional design tools such as Browseware and Clo. Um, and there are different tools that are used for apparel versus footwear, but those 3D tools, as well as some of those 2D tools, can actually integrate into your pattern making software, as well as being able to integrate digital fabric swatches to create 3D digital sampling, 3D digital images. Um, and then also product lifecycle management, which is a tool that allows you to design, develop, commercialize your own products. Um, and many of the companies that you're working with are currently using PLM. And they are most likely trying to, if you're not already working with them in some sort of a vendor portal where you're able to communicate tech packs, um, costing, or you know, just material information back and forth, they are starting to ask that of more and more of their suppliers and companies out there. So it's, it's the trend that the industry is moving into in terms of technology. It's time saving, it's cost saving. I know the initial cost of it does cost a lot, but in the long run, it actually winds up saving companies quite a bit of money. Peter, if you could move on to the next slide. So potential market entry strategies. So we have a business to business. So that's where you would be working directly with brands um, or with retailers and then business to consumer, which would be developing your own products and selling them straight to the consumers. And in both scenarios, technology is your friend. Um, being able to communicate business to business relies heavily on that electronic data interchange that we talked about EDI a few minutes ago, where you are able to communicate back and forth. You're able to receive purchase orders. You're able to receive sales orders. You're able to send that information electronically, validate that information. And then direct to consumer where you would have your own website, you would have your own e-commerce platform behind that where you're able to capture orders, where you're able to communicate directly with your consumers, where you're able to transmit, um, sorry, inventory levels, uh, somebody's moving the slides around, where you're able to transmit inventory levels, where you're able to transmit um, sales order confirmation, capture um, financial transactions, ship and send shipping notices to your customers. So both of these ways, again, it's, it's the way our consumers are moving, it's the way our retail stores are moving, it's the way our wholesalers are moving. Um, anyhow, okay, so next slide, please. Your business to business strategy channels, so retailers and connecting with them 
I think this is my slide. So connecting with them through trade shows, connecting with them through your networks, connecting with them again through your e-commerce um, and websites, as well as having your own digital types of showrooms where you can present your collections. So whether it's a digital showroom, which would require those digital tools, or a physical showroom where you have buying offices, agents and sales reps that are that have physical samples and are actually going out on your behalf to sell those products um, to consumers or to retailers or, or to those brands. Let me, let me interrupt you a second, Jill, because actually sure. I'd, I'd like to ask um, Francis for her opinion. So I think showrooms have been some physical showrooms have been something on the decline. Is, is that fair? And I don't know if Anne has a an input yeah, on that. I, I I'm, uh, yeah, the, the showrooms are, the marts downtown are pretty deserted. Um, if you do find, you know, I always sort of caution you, I'm, you know, sort of learned the hard way. Um, finding the right sales rep, you know, I always say is like finding the right husband. You have to investigate the market, know what they're doing understand their merchandise and really you can't beat visiting somebody to sort of see the showrooms are they the types of showrooms you want i mean i've been working you know with of course internationally but domestically with a lot of companies and i had one girl who had a sales rep in new york but she was in la and she said well i'm paying you have to pay showroom participation fee and that showroom participation fee could be in new york new york it could be 1200 a month Plus, you're paying commission. So if you've got to pay commission on clothing 12% to your sales rep, plus you're paying a monthly fee, this can really drag your budget down rapidly. So getting and making sure that you have the right sales rep, do your investigation. Um, this girl who was paying a, a thousand a month, I said, she said she's not getting any sales. I said, don't tell them you're going. You fly out there and you see what's going on. She went out there. Well, if these reps, they're called multiple line reps, there are corporate reps, multiple line reps, and road reps. If they're a multiple line rep, they can have 10, 12 companies in the showroom. So that means they're collecting twelve, a thousand dollars from each of these without doing any business whatsoever. So this girl goes out there and then her products are in the back closet. So again, it's built on relationships. I had a, a line here and uh, a rep in New York said she wanted to show it and I sent all the duplicates to her and nothing happened. And I had a friend who went to check on them and she said, well, your line's there, but they've cut your label out, put somebody else's in. So this is if you have your own brand. Now, most of you are not at that stage, but when you progress and if you decide to progress, progress to that stage again it will be built a lot of it on the relationship of the people you're working with and understanding the dynamics of the industry as it were the retailers or the sales so sorry that's just a crash course on um, getting your sales right i also want to jump jump in um i totally agree with what francis said I think um, like with everybody, when you really want to go with a showroom and if it's your own line in the future, you have to make sure, like Francis says, to build relationships, but also have your right business mindset. Bring it in like you do with any other business. Ask them what are their channels, what's their revenue, set up a business plan and targets with them, have the right contract in place. If they don't fulfill within three months a certain amount of orders they've promised you, you're going to have an exit strategy through your contract and you don't have to stay with them. So um, my experience and I've worked with showrooms in L.A. and also in Europe before. And it's as long as you like do the business the way you would normally do. Look at your contracts, negotiate, um, know the references, talk to references, ask, OK, I want to talk to one or two of your other clients um, who you're working with or the other brands. You should be on the safe side, but it is nothing which goes quickly, obviously. It's a lot of work to find the right showroom. It's a lot of work to really find a good partner. And that's like finding a good brand, finding um, so like building your network is time intense for sure. 
yeah, having a contract is really important and understanding that contract as far as some of them will, will have their contract. Well, you, you know, you've got to make sure that it's, you know, they're working for you. Remember, they are working for you. Now, salespeople are good at sales. Why are they good at sales? Because they're good at talking. So, you know, you need to find the right sales rep who will represent your brand, has the connections to the stores that you want to sell to. And I would say, you know, you can do your investigation by maybe finding out brands that you feel that are similar to yours and maybe getting some suggestions. But it's not all bad. Finding the right rep is going to make your business. You know, they are an essential part. Where, where do you meet? Where do you meet the reps? How I, you... I, I find the best way is go when you walk the trade shows, uh, the branded trade shows, and you see how they're working and you find out which trade show you feel your products belong to. You walk the trade shows. You watch the booths. You can learn a lot. You know, don't interrupt them. Just go and see, pick up a card, take it with you. Uh, there are markets when you go to here in L.A. and there are markets in New York. You can walk the showrooms, see what's going on, um, take notice of how you feel they're working. Uh, sometimes the showrooms will rent you space within their space for for show times. So um, you can rent a, a small space, it's a bit like a, we're talking about pop-up stores. So you can rent your own little pop-up store in a showroom and sell your own products and you will pay the sales rep um, something for that, using that facility for that time. So yeah, it's again, I know it's very complex as we know this industry is incre incredibly complex, but again, it's also built on finding the right partners for your, for what you want to try to do. So is this, is this my slides now, Peter? Sure. Okay, sure. so you want to go to the next one? Okay, so again, finding the right uh, trade show is dependent on do you have your own brand? So you won't be going to Coterie or some of the bigger shows, if uh, branded shows, unless you have your own brand. But again, walking them, you'll learn a lot, see how they're showing, see how they're merchandising, see how they sell. Go to the trade shows and observe all this, it will really help you in your own. Now, most of the people we were working with are were showing up sourcing. And this is the first time we've had an online tr virtual trade show. So we've, I think we've all learned a lot. Um, I'm talking to the management at sourcing. They uh, were talking about doing training for the exhibitors. So they understand better because I think there was a lot of confusion. Uh, they understand better what they should do to uh, show their goods. And they're also working with the buyers who were also confused about how to find the right products for what they were looking for. So we're talking about doing two training sessions, one for the exhibitors and one for the buyers. So I, I think that it, I think the next experience, which starts on the 1st of March, which will be for two months, should be a better performance. So those of you, and I think these virtual trade shows, even when we go back to the real shows, will be affixed. They will keep these. And we've talked about that. And I think that's that's a good idea. So possibly we might be going back in August. Um, but in the meantime, online trade shows, as we know, not only sourcing, but there are plenty of other trade shows that um, also are doing also virtual. So again, making sure you understand the trade shows, which ones you belong to, uh, doing your brand research, uh, also making sure that you understand merchandising. And this is where sales reps are genius at that, is how to put together and merchandise the products, showing them in different ways so that it can uh, entice whether or not it's a, a top with leggings or a top with tailored pants, putting them and showing them in a way that's uh, visually giving people an idea how these clothing is going to be worn together. So next slide, Peter, please. Here we're talking about merchandising examples um, and and put these together. You can see it's got a story and it's, it's implementing one another and it shows how the goods can be worn together in different ways. So merchandising is really key. Um, I've helped companies display their goods in a booth and they've, you know, the next, I go back a few hours later and they've just crowded it all up 
and it's all lost. It has to have a visual impact. So don't crowd it with too much stuff. You can always get things out if you want to that applies maybe to a certain buyer. So really it's key and it's really a such important thing these days to understand merchandising. And merchandising and designing, I mean, you used to say you've got to be a designer. Well, merchandisers, you know, as it was pointed out to me many years ago, merchandisers actually earn more money than designers because they know how to sell and they know how to show the goods. So I can't emphasize it enough. Learn how to show your products so that it will be an impact with the buyers as they walk by. Thank you. So, you know, clothing is visual. Uh, keep it simple. A modern clean hangers make sure the hangers are all the same don't mix up your wood hangers with your plastic hangers make sure you've got a concise way of merchandising your goods organizing them um, also having the right demeanor when you're meeting clients is also very important um, we've had uh, situations in the past where you've got the actual exhibitor standing there and very daunting with a big suit and tie on and remember, most buyers are women, so you need to have a way of showing your goods, but also being inviting to the buyers that come around and making sure. Maybe sometimes, I mean, they may have, oh, you want free water or you want this, this or having plants there. It's important that you have it organized and you have a plan as to how you can connect with the buyers who are walking by. They may not be coming to see you. They might be coming to see the next booth, but having some kind of a, a way of pulling them in one way or another. Um, there are different ways of doing it. We can always talk about that depending on what it is your goods are. So uh, what's that one? Note, renting furniture can be expensive sometimes. Um, yes, it can. Uh, maybe IKEA has options, upgrades. Yeah, you can bring your own stuff in. Sometimes they don't will let, let you do that. The, exhibit, the exhibition hall won't bring you own furniture in, they'll only let you rent it. So yeah, you, and, and also they don't want it to look a big mishmash. So they want it to look merchandised as well. So as you can see from the examples here. Thank you, Peter. Okay, and then we've got the California Mart. So the fashion district is all in one space. So as we talked about finding a showroom, uh, walking the floors and you'll find in the marts, well, the California Mart, which is under huge, uh, uh, um, a big rebuild, um, but they have like the men's floor, the children's floor, the contemporary floor, uh, fast fashion. So understanding where your particular product lays and which, which showroom they belong, uh, walking the marts. I, I always actually should say this, but I find the new mart to be uh, much more contemporary and better designed looking uh, showrooms. Mind you, I haven't seen the Calmart for a couple of months. Um, there's a Cooper building as well, which is, they're all right next to one another in the middle of the fashion district. New York is a little bit more spread out, but again, finding the showrooms that you feel that your products will fit into is really important for you to reach out and find the right sales rep possibly. Um, or find the companies that you want to produce for. Um, yeah, we talked about and contracts. Just, yeah. just, just to interrupt you a second, um, Francis, and I think you a point you said in a previous webinar was that the markets on the East Coast and West Coast are, are quite different. And mm. um, so, so thinking about regional markets in the, in the US is important. It's actually, um, yeah, of course, it's colder over there, so they've got more layers. Um, tended to be more formal, but I think it's because of what's gone on with the pandemic, everything's gone more casual. Um, it's probably more with coloring more than anything. Uh, if you go to Dallas market, it's very different. Florida market, very different. Uh, or Miami market. So having an understanding of the dynamics and the demographics of the American market is also very important. If you go to Seattle, you're going to be looking at more rain wear and, and more outer wear. Um, it's it's a very interesting to sort of understand the dynamics of the American market, which if, if you can get into it is huge. And that whole, the crossing of trends, you know, there's no real, as we talked about, no real trends, except probably with that leisure being 
one of the biggest trends. And having a Bernie Sanders t-shirt. <laughs> right. I think you talked about costs already, but but uh, you have a point here about um, considerations in signing an agreement. Uh, what other brands a showroom is representing and and yeah, control. making sure that you're yeah. yeah that you're not too much in in uh, competition with the other brands. Making sure that and and really that's what the showrooms, uh, the sales reps will help you with. And there are some amazing sales reps out there who who will make your company. Um, and so it's really important that you watch how they work, uh, have a look at their customer list, uh, who they sell to. Again, having a good relationship for them is, is, is really going to be the success of your own relationship with them. Showroom petition, pay, position, pay, sorry, showroom participation fee, uh, commissions, market expenses. Sometimes they'll ask you to give some money when they go to market. It's quite expensive. So they'll ask for monthly and a commission. So again, you need to budget and understand your own marketing plan and what your finances are if you decide to build your own brand and go to market that way. Hmm. And, and, um, Wholesaling, uh, I remember when I was learning marketing in the late 70s and early 1980s, they the saying wholesaling was going to disappear because of the rise of the big retailers. But uh, but actually, it's still an important business. And it's it's a very important business in in uh, US apparel. And, and um, there's a lot of big, sophisticated wholesalers I know in um, around the Los Angeles area. Um, yeah. And, uh, that these are, are good potential clients. They supply um, they supply the smaller retail chains, the uh, some of the department stores. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, we had a question here about what are the fees. Well, um, as I was saying about New York, fees were about a thousand to eleven hundred. I think they've gone down because of what's going on with everything else. New uh, L.A. was probably I heard eight hundred. So if you're paying eight hundred a month and you're paying uh, 10 12 percent and that depends if you're doing jewelry or accessories you may be paying 15 percent so the commission is on clothing between 10 and 12 percent and on accessories would be around 15 percent plus showroom participation fee unless you get a road rep who will not be charging you a showroom participation fee they will just be charging you commission but again understand and get that connection to the showrooms and make sure that's the showroom that you want to be in and they are going to represent your company um again you know taking the expense of maybe coming out here will help you understand the overall market okay all right i think this is Anne. but direct to consumer strategies this is huge this is where a lot of new companies, and actually I have to say, are being very successful. They're cutting out the middleman and they can sell direct. So this, but it, what's it key to, of course, will be how you market it, social media. So I'll turn this over to Anne. This is a very interesting time and this is a huge impact on the market. Yes. So um, maybe Jill, because the websites and e-commerce, um, do you want to jump in on the first slide and then I'll continue? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, then, oh, I no, no, I'm, I'm back. Thank you. And okay. thanks for your patience. I don't know what happened this morning. My computer just decided to quit. So, all right. Um, so in terms of websites and e-commerce strategy, um, it, it, it's very important in this day and age when somebody wants to check out your company, you know, we go to LinkedIn as a global networking platform for individuals, but when we want to find out about companies, we go to their websites. And the first thing we want to see about that company is the type of products that they're selling, um, the type of capacity that they have. When we go to an actual e-commerce website and we want to see the actual products on display, it needs to be something that makes sense to somebody visually. It needs to communicate the type of product that you have. It needs to communicate the style that you have. It needs to communicate the quality that you have. Um, that's what customers are looking at and they are 
making a decision right away as they look at your screen. Does this look like a company I want to do business with? Does it look like they can make the types of products that I'm looking for? Um, you know, do they have the products I want to buy right now? What, what, what is it that they're looking at? And without having a profile that stands out from your competition, that communicates the types of products that you make, communicates your capacity, ability to make these products, you're, you're creating a disadvantage for yourself. And I know that Anne and, and Francis have talked about that in a number of the workshops that they've done on what the websites need to look like. But something as the example here, that's just plain white, it's got easy navigation, it's got the products, they're visible images, they're quality looking images, they're not blurry, they're not just two dimensional line art. All of those things go into making that visual presentation and helping set you aside, set you apart from your competitors. Um, Anne, go ahead, thanks. Yes. Okay, on the next slide, if we jump to the, we, what we wanna do is also point out a couple of considerations and important factors when you wanna go direct to consumer. Even though this is like, it, it's very, it sounds very attractive, obviously to cut out the middleman, go direct, but there's also, it seems easier sometimes than it is at the end. If you look, for example, about setting up your business in the U.S. with the U.S. consumer, you have to set up your logistics and fulfillment um, because international shipping might be too expensive, tracking uh, the U.S. customer has really high expectations. So you're competing at this point with U.S. brands. So you have to have the same lead times or the same shipping times. So finding a third-party logistics partner, 3PL, for example, could be an option. Um, but that also means it's a long process of evaluating, making sure system requirements are met. How does the whole operation or can it be set up? You're also having inventory risks, which need to be considered and calculated in your business plan. Um, really think of your returns. Think of um, if there's any quality issues. So definitely the US customer returns many items. And if you think of not being an established brand yet, that could be a really high risk. Um, then technology to manage sales orders, the inventory return processing and customer service, overall the technology to set it up, to be able to do it in the right pace, to do it in the right quality to succeed in the market takes time. Also, of course, it, you have to have the US dollar currency shopping needs available. If you have your own online shop operated from Egypt, make sure you have the currencies um, set up correctly um, and also on Amazon Marketplace. When we then, um, the keyword here is Amazon, looking at the next slide, we know Amazon has been um, also the giant in the market and taking over a lot of fashion business, pushing into the market. There is an option to sell through Amazon Marketplace. The um, caution we want to give here is like uh, similar to showrooms, to everything else we have uh, talked about. It is not a quick action. You cannot expect like to just go ahead and sign a contract. Make sure to set up a business plan and calculate all costs involved. Amazon has a lot of small fine print of costing marketing expenses. So um, the positive or the advantage here with Amazon is definitely you're tapping into an existing system and technology. Of course, your end has to be your bank, back end has to fit that, but at least you don't have to struggle to set it up customer facing. Um, but of course your products, products can get lost in a huge marketplace. So um, it is not cheap to work with Amazon. You have to calculate your marketing expenses, which are many times mandatory working with M Amazon. So um, very cautioned, um, it is an option, but also it can be a risky one. Make sure to read all the fine print. This is about um, going direct to consumer. So we have given you insights a little bit on business to business, direct to consumer. Of course, in, if you have any other questions for us, more detailed on specifics, 
Um, we do, do not have time to take today to go more into more slides and we are through our slides. So um, we basically thank you for, for listening. And our last slide, what we wanna show you is also we talked about the inauguration today um, and we will still also hear your questions, but we left this picture on the last slide because um, Amanda Gorman inspired, I think the world and America at the inauguration um, we all looking um, at a brighter future, I think, even with the pandemic still ongoing and raging and seeing what Peter and everybody, we have um, given you an overview how the US is doing, but we seeing light at the end of the tunnel for sure from, if you think of March till now, what has already changed, like things are moving forward. So this is basically a positive end message about like, there is um, things are changing, evolving, and there can always be found new ways of doing business and adapting to the changes in the market quickly. And um, I'm going to hand over to Peter also for questions or any anybody else who wants to add something. Sure, I just I just like to add a couple of things about the direct to consumer. Um, so one of the things about direct to consumer is, and I think we mentioned it before, sometimes returns can be really high, up to 30%. So a critical thing in selling direct to consumer is making sure that you're communicating clearly with the consumer. They know exactly what they're getting. And, and, and you have to remember that um, you know, sizing in the US is not very standard. Um, um, small, medium, and large, and extra large depend on who the brand is. And um, often you have to describe the measurements of your product. So a large is this big, a small is that big. But remember that the US is the last holdout for English measurements. Um, everything is done in feet and inches, not in millimeters and centimeters. And similarly, in weight, it's done in ounces and pounds and, and, um, and not in uh, kilograms. So, um, so you have to remember to, that um, English measurements, uh, you know, what are federal measurements in the United States, are the rule in describing things. And I say this because actually my wife's company that was a uh, direct-to-consumer business operating out of Hong Kong is currently closing down. They were, they, were not, they were doing a tiny bit of apparel. They were mostly other goods. But the thing is, they didn't understand the US market. And they were shipping stuff that, that they developed for the European market and trying to sell it in the United States. And um, these were products that were developed for European needs, not for American needs. And then they were trying to um, describe them in terminology that made sense in, let's say, the UK, but not in the United States. So some of the products they were trying to sell were, were uh, diapers um, for babies. And, um, but actually, they, they were calling them nappies. Well, in, in, in the UK, a diaper is a nappy. But if you say to an American audience, uh, we're selling nappies, they'll have no clue what you are talking about. So working with um, direct to consumer, you really have to know um, the, the, um, uh, um, the terminology and, and what language um, they understand in terms of measurements and everything. And, and a second point I wanted to make was um, Amazon policies, because um, my understanding of Amazon is that um, they will take your, they will sell your merchandise, but if it doesn't move, um, they will send it back to you and um, send you the bill for the shipping. And um, so, as as Anne said, their their contracts are, are, are quite quite brutal, but they're a fabulous marketplace. So again, if you can meet the high standards. Um, and get the product right, then you know it's it, the opportunities are enormous. Uh, but you you have to get it right. And and going back to a point that um, uh, Francis said earlier, um, I, I remember a a phrase. Um, I think it's a Russian phrase, uh, which is trust but verify. So if if you when you're working with a partner in the United States, trust them, but also verify. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, Amazon can be brutal. Um, I've worked with them uh, both on the advantage side and on the marketplace. And I would suggest 
only going to the marketplace, not to advantage. But again, stressing tech packs, um, having making sure that you have people in your factory who can put together some really good tech packs because if they're working with an American company, the American company will also have their own technical designer often and they will be working with your designer to get the right tech packs put together backwards and forwards. So um, having, and I'm Jill's the expert on this, is making sure that you have the right software that you, and also the training to understand what it is that goes into a tech pack. And the tech pack is going to be used, it's, a, it's actually a legal document. Do you have anything to add to that? I was actually going to just say with a lot of the, the product life cycle management software, to Peter's point, where uh, companies in the U.S. might put in their measurements or, you know, points of measure or, you know, however they want the, the garment laid out, they can put it out in imperial values and the technology will automatically convert it into metric, which is very helpful for factories to make sure that we're always on the same page no pun intended, um, and then vice versa. It can transmit metric and translate that back into imperial values. Not so easy to do when you're trying to do it manually. If you are using a PLM system and or you are working within a vendor portal to communicate back and forth, those software applications will, will actually do the translation for you. I have a quick question to Jill uh, with regard to the EDI. Uh, do you think that a lot of companies use EDI anymore? Yes, a lot of companies do use EDI. It is really the standard bearer to be able to communicate back and forth with sales orders, purchase orders, inventory levels, um, shipping notices, payment notices, and so on. And it's not it's not just the manufacturer to the brand, but it's also the brand to the retailer and so on. So it's really one thing in the supply chain that can tie every all of that communication together. Typically, the manufacturer isn't reaching out directly to the retailer unless they're making products for the retailer. Manufacturer, it, uh, sorry, the, the, the factories aren't reaching out to the retailer directly. The factories are typically going through the brand. The brand's communicating back and forth to both of those unless factory is manufacturing directly to retailer, in which case the communication doesn't need that middle layer in there. So Jill, what about RFID? Are they using RFID? Um, I mean, it was taking off, I know that. Um, it's come down in price to, to add this to the garments. It used to be like 23 cents a garment. Right, so RFID is a technology that's radio frequency identification and is a technology that is also being used. So it can be being used with on a factory floor for companies that are doing bundle tracking. So instead of using the actual scanner and barcode to track piece goods as they move through the manufacturing process, some factories use these radio frequency ID tags. So you don't necessarily need to take a physical scanner as it moves through the factory. The, the radio frequency is communicating that information on the factory floor. RFID is also technology that um, some retailers have asked for to be included on their tags um, for security purposes because it can send off, it can send a, um, can send a signal if it moves through. Um, trying to think of the right word. I apologize. Hold on one second. So it, it can send a signal as it moves through a store where the product is on the, in the store, where the product is in the back in the warehouse or sorry, in, in the inventory section. And it can also send a signal if it hasn't been deactivated as it moves through security scanner. So if somebody is trying to shoplift an item and they walk out the door, it can produce that signal that indicates that somebody's stealing it and make a noise. So, but it, where we thought RFID would be very prevalent in the industry, it's not mandatory. So some companies use it, some retailers like it, some retailers ask for it to be incorporated into the, the ticketing and the tagging on their products, others don't. And if I were a factory, I wouldn't necessarily invest in RFID technology. That's just me. I think it's a little bit expensive to monitor things on shop floor if I can get away with using a scanner. But some of the 
higher end factories that um, have a higher profit margin are using RFID technology. Did that answer the question, Muditha? Yeah. Well, I got you. And, and, and just to, uh, I mean, it's not 23 cents anymore, Francis. Now it's in pennies. So it has come down tremendously uh, over the period of well, time. They can print it on a label too now, can't they? They're, they're trying to use it in multiple ways, even like uh, we did not have the washing capability, but now you can actually include it in, you can actually include RFID in a, in a thread. I have a friend of mine who has done a project with, uh, um, uh, actually he developed his own company, uh, include in, introducing the RFID in a sewing thread. So. Oh yeah, great. I, I think um, if I remember Amazon have got a store now where they, you can literally pick up what you want in the store and just walk straight out. Yep. And um, yes. you don't need to go through a checkout as you don't need to go through a manual checkout because all the products of RFID, if you have an RFID enabled credit card, as you walk between the scanners, as you exit the store, it will scan your card, it'll scan whatever you've got with you and charge you as you walk out the door. And, and you can pick up a receipt at the same time, but you don't actually need to go through a checkout. And, and that technology was shown, uh, there's a, there's a well-known, um, um, I think it's an IBM uh, advert from about a decade ago where there's a guy goes into a supermarket and he's putting all kinds of stuff in his pockets. And then he walks out the store and the security guard chases him out and says, excuse me, sir, you forgot your receipt. And the technology has been around a long time. Um, but uh, I believe Amazon now are introducing stores where you can do that. You can just go in, take what you want. And, and if you have a, an RFID enabled credit card, you just need to walk out the store and it'll charge you for whatever you have on you. Um, I see Rania has a question. Yes. Uh, um, yes, my question, uh, I wrote it already on the chat, but I wasn't very clear about it. Uh, yes. My question is concerning uh, the, uh, the websites and how important it is for companies uh, in our current situation to put like uh, photos of the products themselves on the website. Uh, in addition, of course, to their manufacturing capabilities and everything, but how important it is to show their products like... Um, and I don't know how how can they take the photos from um, close, they take a, a close uh, photo or, because of course they can they can make a lot of styles and make a lot of uh, uh, um, um, products. So how can they put this on the website in a practical way that would show the buyers that we want to uh, work with that uh, company or not? So what would be your advice? Well, they can take pictures of the garments on on a form, you know, or and you've got Photoshop and Illustrator, you can clean it all up. So if you've got the ability to, you'll need somebody to understand Photoshop and Illustrator to be able to put it up there and exhibit it and clean it up. But definitely, and like um, I think it was Jill talking about in the beginning or Anne, uh, putting together your website, making sure that it's, there's white, not black. You never do a fashion show with a black curtain behind you. You'll always see it's white. So it's important that you have a good background. Make sure that the garments and they've got details. So say, say you've got some speciality with embroidery or printing, then you can always do a close up of that. Put it next to the garment. Make sure that, you know, people are going to your website to look at your garments and what you're making. So that's your first story. You can go to the rest of it after that, but making sure that it's clean, precise, it's well understood. You can merchandise it so it can show how it's worn. But yeah, definitely, Rania, you, they, they need to have a clear message when people visit the websites. And I think also, uh, I think this is what um, we were talking about in the previous uh, webinars also, how important the 2D to 3D and then uh, 3D visualization software that you can use and you can actually communicate initial communication with buyers without even making a garment. I know it's not 100% um, visual, but uh, there are a lot of decisions can be made from moving from uh, 2D CAD to 3D CAD and then actually draping and visualization. And now you, we have systems where they can actually uh, replicate different fabrications, the fabric dynamics, the fabric uh, mechanics, uh, 
Uh, and uh, in fact, I was talking to Browseware the other day and they, ha they have the fabric analyzer where we can analyze the fabric. And actually that fabric analyzer, the data can, now there's another company called Visu that we are trying to get that for our students, where actually that provide you the texture. So if we give the fabric data, Visu software will provide you the texture. So let's say you are, um, you, you are stone washed denim fabric of uh, eight ounce. So you can actually do the fabric analyzer, get the data feeding into the Visu. Visu will give you the texture of the fabric. Now that fabric texture, we can drape 3D and then that 3D, we can rotate 360 and we can share that information with the buyer for initial discussion. And then actually when you make the sample, then you can put it in what Francis was saying about the right background, the right uh, form. And that is actually in the further um, for the later stages, but initial discussions can be done. A lot of decisions can be made. Uh, and that is the way the industry is actually going to move forward in the future to cut down that we are talking about speed to market. Uh, the, I think there was a question here about finding um, information about the agents in America. Uh, there are books from each of the marts and in the books, uh, you will see the information for all of the reps, uh, whether it's the CalMart or the New Mart. Um, they, I think we had some links you had originally, right, and added links for showrooms on some of the slides. So it's in um, the slides. It's in the slides. The yeah. 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 So yeah, you can follow know. through with those and, and start checking them out. Sure, sure. Just to make it uh, clear for everyone, this uh, these uh, links will be available on the presentation that will be sent in the email uh, with the with the with the, the recording as well of uh, this session. So, uh, is there anyone else who has a question for for our team of experts? We have already uh, passed two hours for this uh, webinar, so I think it's uh, it was too long for you uh, doing all the talking. So, just in case we have uh, um, a last question, so we'll take it. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll end the the session of today. So. Well, while we wait for somebody to think of a question. So let me say that our, our next uh, and final planned webinar of the series is going to be four weeks today, which is February the 21st. And um, for that webinar, we'd like to keep it more of an open architecture um, and, and really um, uh, have no set presentation, but uh, have a, um, a complete interactive discussion uh, Q and A, and um, we will bring some prompts uh, to help. But um, we hope you can join us for that one and um, and develop your questions um, and and bring them for that webinar on um, February the twenty first, which is four weeks today, and will be at the same time. And and I'm also working with Yasmin to create the last of my webinars, which is with product lifecycle management, 2D technology, 2D design, 3D design, and integrated materials to help those of you who are interested in understanding what that looks like, what the process is, what the output is, what it looks like. Um, so I will be working and Yasmin will help me schedule in the next few weeks as well. Thank you, Jill. Okay. Uh, so I think we don't have any more questions. So uh, with that, I thank you. I thank everyone, and we come to the end <laughs> to the to the session of today. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you thank everybody. You. Thank you. Renee, Bye. nice thank to see you. you. Bye. 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 B